Welcome, students, to the first of our Chapter 4 lecture discussion on the reactions of alkenes. As I ponder this subject, I can't help but be reminded about this one time that I was sitting in the lab filtering about three liters of diethyl ether. Interestingly enough, when I turned on my vacuum pump, the spark that emitted from that switch ignited the ether vapors and caused a detonation that ended up completely blowing apart the door on my hood to the vacuum chamber compartment. Had I been standing in front of that door, it easily would have broken both my legs. Fortunately, I wasn't. And as a result, the only thing that happened was a massive fire in our lab, which I was able to extinguish using the nearby fire extinguisher. I think it might have been the most calm execution of safety protocol I've ever engaged in, and also one of the only times in my lab career in which I've audibly sworn out loud. <laughs> After today's lecture, you should be able to correctly draw the mechanism and predict the product formed when HX is added to an alkene. This comes from section 4.1 of our text. Have memorized the order of carbocation stability. Tertiary is more stable than secondary is more stable than primary, which comes from section 4.2 of our text. Identify the regioselectivity that occurs when HX is added to an alkene from section 4.4 of our text. Predict when a carbocation rearrangement will occur and identify the resulting products from section 4.7 of our text and determine according to Zaitsev's rule which of various alkenes is most stable from section 4.13. With that said, let's get started. We've seen this reaction in our previous chapter. We can take an alkene and add a hydrogen halide, HX, where X is either a chlorine or a bromine or an iodine, and we end up generating one of two possible products. You might recall from our previous chapter discussion that in the mechanism for this reaction, the pi electrons from the alkene come out and attack the hydrogen, breaking the hydrogen chlorine bond. That generates a carbocation intermediate and then the chloride comes back in and attacks it to form a bond, generating one of these two products. Here's the interesting observation that has been experimentally determined. This reaction only forms product one and not product two, which should elicit the magical question from you, why? Of course I'm going to explain why, but in order for you to understand the answer, I need you to memorize one thing that is crucially important. You have to remember that different carbocations are differently stable depending on how many carbons are bonded to them. You need to memorize, and I demand that you, my students, memorize this, that tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations, which are more stable than primary carbocations, which are more stable than methyl carbocations. Now, some of you might be asking, what is the difference between these three things? A tertiary carbocation is a carbocation in which the positively charged carbon is stuck to three different carbons. Each of these R groups in this particular drawing represent carbons. A secondary is a carbocation in which the positively charged carbon is stuck to two carbons. A primary is one in which the positively charged carbon is stuck to one carbon. And a methyl is where it's bonded to just hydrogens. So once again, I want you to remember, tertiary carbons are the most stable of the ones shown on the slide, followed by secondary, followed by primary, followed by methyl. I once heard an organic chemistry professor joke that primary and methyl carbocations are so unstable that it's possible that they only really exist in extreme conditions like those found in interstellar space. With that as background, we get back to our question. Why does this reaction only form product one and not product two? The answer is because forming product two would require going through a less stable carbocation intermediate. I'd like to show you this by looking at some hand-drawn images that I've done myself. Here is our molecule, this alkene, which I've drawn, for the sake of ease, I've labeled the carbon to the left as carbon 1 and the carbon to the right as carbon 2. You'll note that in this reaction, pi electrons come out of the double bond and attack the hydrogen in the HCl. That then breaks the HCl bond and thrusts these two electrons up onto the Cl, which turns it into a chloride, Cl minus. 
what does that make? <laughs> well, in this particular moment, the hydrogen has a choice. And it's not like hydrogen's really choosing to do this, but I want you to imagine that it does. It can choose to either attach to carbon 1 or attach to carbon 2. Now keep in mind, whichever carbon it doesn't attach to is the carbon that ends up with the positive charge. So if hydrogen attaches to carbon 1, then that means that carbon 2 is the guy that ends up with the positive charge. What happens next? Well, the chloride comes in, forms a bond with that carbon, plugging that hole, and forms this product, which we label as compound 2. Now, in contrast, if we have our same alkene and the pi electrons come out and attack the hydrogen, breaking the hydrogen-chlorine bond, but instead the hydrogen attaches and forms a bond with carbon 2, then where does the positive charge end up? It ends up on carbon 1. What happens afterward? The chloride comes in, forms a bond with carbon 1, plugs that hole, and gives me product 1. As you might remember from the previous slide, I told you that only product 1 forms and product 2 does not. Why in the world is that the case? Here's why. You'll note that carbon 2 up here is a primary carbocation. That is, it's a positively charged carbon that is only bonded to one carbon. Because it's only bonded to one carbon, it is a primary carbocation. In contrast, this carbon is a tertiary carbocation. You'll note that this particular carbon is bonded to one, two, three carbons. Because it is a tertiary carbocation, it is much more stable than a primary carbocation. Hence, this is the way in which this reaction will proceed. It will go through this tertiary carbocation and form product 1. It will not go through the extremely unstable primary carbocation to form product 2. That is why product 1 is the only product that is made in this reaction. This can be summarized by a magical rule called Markovnikov's rule, which I sometimes just call Markey's rule for short although that might be considered disrespectful to anyone who has the last name Markovnikov. Nevertheless, here's what Markovnikov's rule says. It says when HX is added to an alkene, the H attaches to the carbon that has more hydrogens on it, and the X attaches to the carbon with fewer hydrogens on it. Let's go back to our previous example and see if that ends up being the case. You'll note that beginning with my starting material right here, I am adding hydrogen chloride. I can attach the hydrogen to carbon 1 or carbon 2. Remember from Markovnikov's rule that the hydrogen is going to attach to the carbon that has more hydrogens on it. Hence, it will attach to carbon 2. The chlorine, in contrast, will attach to the carbon that has fewer hydrogens on it. Hence, it attaches to carbon 1, which is why I end up getting product 1 shown here. Why in the world does that end up being the case? Well, as we already delineated, product 1 ends up going through a mechanism that gives me the more stable tertiary carbocation as opposed to the less stable primary carbocation necessary to form product 2. Let's see if you guys can tackle a lecture problem on your own. Predict the products of the following reaction. Now I'm going to actually show you the mechanism and answer for this momentarily, but I would highly advise that you pause the video now and see if you can tackle it by yourself. Here's the answer. We begin with our starting material here. Electrons are of course going to come out of that double bond, attacking the hydrogen in my HCl and breaking the HCl bond. The hydrogen of course now has a choice. It can attach to carbon 1 or carbon 2. According to Markovnikov's rule, the hydrogen is always going to attach to the carbon that has more hydrogens on it. Hence, it would attach to carbon 2. Nevertheless, for the sake of thoroughness, I'm going to show both case scenarios. If it attaches to carbon 2, we are going to end up with this intermediate. Note that the carbon, 1 or 2, that doesn't get the hydrogen attached to it is the one that ends up with the positive charge. At this point, the chloride can come in, plug that hole, 
and form a bond giving us this product. Now, in contrast, if this molecule's electrons come out, attack the hydrogen, breaking that bond, and then place the hydrogen on carbon one, I end up with this intermediate right here. If the chloride then comes in to form a bond there, we end up with this product. Which of these two products will end up being formed and which one will not? To answer that, we look at the intermediates. You'll note that this intermediate up here is a tertiary carbocation. That is, it is a positively charged carbon that's stuck to one, two, three carbons. Whereas this intermediate has a secondary carbocation, a positively charged carbon that is only attached to one, two carbons. Which of those two intermediates is more stable? The tertiary carbocation. Hence, the product shown over here is going to be the one that will be favored and be formed preferentially over the product shown down here. This once again falls in line exactly with what Markovnikov's rule says. When you take an alkene and you add HX, in this case HCl, the hydrogen always ends up on the carbon that has more hydrogens on it and the chlorine ends up on the carbon that has fewer hydrogens on it. You'll note that between carbons one and two, carbon two has one hydrogen on it whereas carbon one has zero. Hence, our hydrogen from our HCl ends up on carbon two, and our chlorine ends up on carbon one. This brings us to a wonderful problem set. Question, which of the following examples is the most stable carbocation? I personally believe that I've given you enough information to be able to determine the answer on your own. Here's another one. Which of the following alkenes reacts with HCl at the slowest rate? Now, I'm not going to give you the answer to this question. I am, however, going to give you a hint. To answer this question, you need to draw out the mechanism for every single one of these five molecules reacting with HCl. You then need to look at each of the carbocation intermediates that are formed. Whichever one forms the least stable carbocation intermediate will be the one that will form the slowest and hence react at the slowest rate.